Hello and welcome to D-Dimer. This is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you as well. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about D-Dimer. D-Dimer is a lab test that is done to find out if we have clots forming in the body. Now this is kind of an interesting way of detecting clots. We're going to be looking for a product that tell us that clots are being broken down. So if clots are being formed in the body, the body is going to naturally break them down. This is part of the whole inflammatory process that clots are made and then the other part of that is the clot has to be broken down. So if you think about getting a cut on your hand, if you get a cut on your hand, eventually that cut is going to scab over and the scab is eventually going to be removed. It's removed from this process of breaking down clots. The product of the broken down clot is called a fibrin split product. This is used, the D-dimer, to detect venous thromboembolism, pulmonary embolisms, stroke, aortic dissection, and also in DIC. So lots of different uses. We've even talked about the possibility of using D-dimer to help us to detect myocardial infarctions. Take a look at this diagram here. Obviously, this is a very complex diagram talking about the coagulation cascade. So you can see what happens. We start over here on the left upper side here, and we have this tissue factor. Tissue factor is released when the tissues are in some way destroyed. So they're either going to have some trauma or we're going to have an infection. Something is causing that tissue factor to be released and that starts a part of an inflammatory process. We have the initiating phase there that is causing a lot of different coagulation factors to be released, and then through the amplification phase, we move into the final development of thrombin. Now with thrombin and fibrinogen, we form a fibrin clot. So this is where the actual clot is being formed, is at the very end, this part down here on the bottom that's kind of highlighted in gray. That is our final result of having this entire process that is happening up above occur and we have that fibrin clot. The body will start to break that clot down and as a result we're going to have pieces of fibrin, fibrin split products, being released. We measure these in the bloodstream and one of those is D-dimer. Conditions that can elevate D-dimer other than just simply having a clot from trauma could incur with myocardial infarction, surgery, malignancy, trauma, infections, liver disease, pregnancy. So you can see there's a lot of different conditions that can cause D-dimer to elevate. In other words, D-dimer is not specific to a particular condition. However, D-dimer is sensitive to telling you that there is a clot somewhere in the body. So let's say that our patient presents and has all of the classic symptoms that we'd associate with a pulmonary embolism. Now doing a D-dimer would be very helpful to tell us, yes, there is a clot in the body. That would also validate the fact that we have this pulmonary embolism. So elevations are going to indicate that we have clot formation. We can use it to predict major bleeding after a patient has venous thromboembolism. That's uh, one uh, way that we can look at our D-dimer. It can be used to monitor the treatment effectiveness during our DIC treatment. So we'd expect to see our D-dimer start to decrease as the DIC treatment is becoming more effective. Elevations above 1500 are associated with reoccurrence of our venous thromboemboli. So we'll see later. We're using usually the cutoff of 1000 to indicate that we've got certain problems, but we're using 1500 as an indication that we have a really high D-dimer indicating that our venous thromboembolism may be reoccurring. Predicts disease severity and but it's not very helpful though for our long-term outcomes, but it is helpful for disease severity. Our strategy for patients who have pulmonary emboli. First of all, we use what's called the PERC rule to rule out pulmonary embolism. 
And what that does is we take these specific criteria to help us to rule in or rule out, in this case ruling out, a venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism. Age greater than 50 years, so that's going to be one of our criteria to, that may help to rule in a PE, a heart rate greater than 100. And again, so the, the rule out criteria would be that our patient doesn't have these. Okay, so uh, try not to be confusing here. So uh, the PERC actually stands for Pulmonary Embolism Rule Out Criteria. So that's why it's, it's listed that way. However, these are the criteria that we're going to use to help us to determine whether the patient could have a PE. So age over 50, heart rate greater than 100, SAO2 less than 95%, so a little hypoxia. Venous thromboemboli, maybe as evidenced by doing a venogram. Recent surgery or trauma, leg swelling, hemoptysis, oral hormone use. So those are going to be some of the rule out criteria that we would use initially looking for those things in our patient. Then we also look at the D-dimer, and again, we're using that number of greater than 1,000 to indicate that the patient has got a very significant clot that could be causing the patient to have a PE. PE has been associated with a possible etiology for syncope. So you have an elderly patient who passes out, and a lot of times we think about that from a neurologic standpoint, but we've also found that 17% of our older patients with syncope had a pulmonary embolism, and that was the cause for their syncope. So often those two things aren't connected together, but in many patients that can be the case. 50% of those had a significant obstruction, screening with D-dimer. We found that 73% of them had tachycardia, tachycardia, tachypnea, hypotension, DVT, and also a positive D-dimer. But 24% had no symptoms of pulmonary embolism. They just had a positive D-dimer. D-dimer as a strategy for mortality prediction. In acute coronary syndrome, we found that D-dimer was an independent predictor of mortality. The cutoff was used was 212. You notice that's much lower than the cutoff we're using for determining whether or not our patient could have a PE. Because we have smaller clots, it's not as going, uh, the number's not going to be as big. Sensitivity, okay, it's pretty sensitive. It's about 70%. Specificity at about 70% as well. So we're going to detect about 70% of them, and about 30% of the time will be wrong. Acute ischemic stroke. We also had some uh, decent numbers here, a good outcome if the D-dimer was elevated to 24 hours but decreased by 48 hours. If the D-dimer was elevated to 24 hours and remained elevated at 48 hours, that was associated with a poor outcome in acute ischemic stroke. So in other words, what's happening here is the good outcomes were associated with the clot being broken down early and reperfusion. Well, thank you for joining me for D-dimer. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now.